Good morning and a welcome to new Russia sanctions details and impact. My name is Sherry Q and I'm the executive director here at CCCC. It's my great pleasure to be emceeing today's legal and policy webinar series, co-hosted by CCCC and Morrison Forrester. If you are not familiar with CGCC, we are an independent, non-partisan, non-governmental chamber of commerce with a mission to create value, generate economic growth, and enhance cooperation between the U.S. and China business communities. We provide a broad range of programs, services, and resources to over a thousand multinational corporate members. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping rules. Today's event will be recorded and it will be available post-event. The PowerPoint presentation will also be available post-event. While today's comments are on the record, the views and opinions expressed by our guests are theirs alone and do not necessarily represent the official views or positions of the institutions they work for. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, you are welcome to bring them up using the Q&A box located on the bottom of your screen. Our speakers will try their best to address them during the Q&A session. Today is our great pleasure to have three distinguished guests from Moise and Forrester. John Smith is former director of the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Asset Control and co-head of Morris and Forrester's national security practice. Gareth Rees is a partner based in London office of Morris and Forrester. He is one of the most experienced business crime and regulatory lawyer in the UK. Felix Helmstetter is counsel based in Berlin office of Morris and Forrester. Felix possesses more than a decade of experience in complex regulatory counseling, compliance, and litigation. Now, without further ado, let's hand it over to John. John, please. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Sherry. Thanks so much for the China General Chamber of Commerce for having us appear to you today. I know that there's so much happening and it's very difficult, I think, for all of us simply to keep track. Gareth and Felix and I and our sanctions and export control colleagues that work with us from the United States, from the European Union, from the United Kingdom, and indeed from China, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, and elsewhere, are doing our best to try to keep up with all of the events in real time. So I know how difficult it has to be for all of you. With that said, why don't we just dive right into the presentation and we're happy to take, uh, as Sherry said, any questions that you may have. So our agenda today will be first to talk about US sanctions, then EU sanctions, then UK sanctions, and then take your questions. Obviously, these aren't the only jurisdictions that are involved, but these three have been coordinating much of the global response. Next slide. U.S. sanctions. Next slide. Um, so first, what we'll cover on the U.S. side are briefly the timeline of U.S. sanctions on Russia, and then a whole host of actions that the U.S. has taken on a variety of issues activities and subjects involving Russia that have been the focus of sanctions and export control. And then the last point I'll make is briefly a point on sanctions fallout, and then I'll turn to Felix and Gareth. Next slide. So the timeline on US sanctions is probably relatively very familiar. In 2014, when Russia invaded Eastern Ukraine and Crimea for the first time, uh, the US and the EU coordinated on a variety of sanctions that are known as blocking sanctions and sectoral sanctions. So we get our terminology straight at the start. I think most of you are familiar that blocking sanctions or asset freezes, as it might be called in the US, EU, and UK together, are when the jurisdictions require that you freeze the assets of sanctioned parties and those that may be owned or owned and controlled by them, uh, as well as you're prohibited from doing any further business uh, with those entities or individuals unless the relevant jurisdiction says you may do so. Sectoral sanctions are a new concept that were introduced in 2014 that basically limit certain aspects of financing, often debt and equity transactions with some of the major uh, Russian entities uh, that exist in, across uh, sectors, principally the financial, defense, and energy sectors. Uh, 
Uh, in 2018, the U.S. made a splash by beginning sanctioning uh, of Russian oligarchs after the 2014 uh, sanctions. Uh, and that's been a practice that's continued up until today. In 2021, President Biden issued a new executive order that uh, authorized sanctions across a broad range of malign activities uh, from Russia. And as you know, for the past two or three weeks, the US and the EU and the UK have imposed substantial costs on Russia in response to Russia's invasion and bloody invasion of Ukraine in recent weeks. Next slide. So the biggest sanctions that have been imposed, the ones that have had the most impact are the sanctions on the Central Bank of Russia. Russia clearly did not see this coming. The G7, the group of seven, which used to be the group of eight, which kicked Russia out in 2014 after the invasion of Ukraine the first time, um, worked together to freeze or restrict the assets of the central bank. And I use the term freeze or restrict because they basically, in different jurisdictions, the language might be different, but the bottom line is the assets of the Central Bank of Russia are not allowed to go back to Russia to be used by Russia to fund the war effort. Um, it is estimated that nearly $700 billion worth of assets are frozen in the US, UK, EU, Canada, and Japan, with much of the rest frozen in China. So at least all but China um, largely have restricted those assets from moving back. They're also restricted um, transactions with not only the central bank, but the National Wealth Fund and the Ministry of Finance. And you'll see here that there are a number of general licenses or authorizations that have been issued to allow limited transactions with the central bank of the Russian uh, Federation, but very limited and by and large, not in a way that allow assets to go back to Russia. And the last point I'll make is that OFAC also sanctioned entities that manage Russia's key sovereign wealth funds, including the Russia Direct Investment Fund and its leader. Next slide. So this is really an action that uh, we'll talk about from the G7 perspective, but it's an action that uh, my colleague Felix might wanna talk a little bit about because it's something that had to occur in the EU because SWIFT is based in the EU. SWIFT is the worldwide global financial payments messaging platform that as you know, global, fin financial, uh, ba global banks use to communicate with each other. Felix, why don't you let us know what the EU did? Thank you, John. Um, yes, indeed, following uh, the agreement um, between the G7 um, allies uh, to remove uh, certain Russian banks from, from SWIFT, it was the EU that has to, had to transpose this um, agreement into law because SWIFT is based in Belgium and uh, EU law um, applies uh, to SWIFT. The EU um, issued a, um, a, a regulation that banned um, uh, the, the provision of specialized financial messaging services. Um, that's the letter of the law early reading um, uh, like this. But this is, of course, targeted at SWIFT in a general um, way. And as of March 12th, um, SWIFT was um, uh, was obliged to disconnect seven uh, Russian banks and their subsidiaries, overall uh, 14 entities right now. And in addition to that, uh, the same now applies to three Belarusian banks, uh, which will be cut off from SWIFT um, March 20, uh, 2022, um, so a few days from now. Back to you, John. Thanks, Felix. And next slide. So the energy-related sanctions are one of the most recent ones that OFAC has begun imposing uh, after President Biden issued a new executive order. Now, the U.S. was able to prohibit much of the U.S. imports of Russian crude and other energy-related products because the U.S. has relatively little reliance on these certain energy products coming from the United States. 
I'll let uh, Gareth talk uh, about how the UK was able to take a relatively similar restriction. And then e uh, Felix gets the harder part in talking about the EU's largely energy dependence on Russia in this current time frame and what the EU is doing about it. So you can see here that the United States has imposed a broad range of restrictions with respect to EU or with respect to Russian energy imports, investment in the energy sector of the Russian economy and US persons being involved. The uh, US did allow um, a wind down general license until the midpoint of April of 2022 uh, to allow the transactions, the investments, the activities that were occurring to wind down over the course of the next month or so. Uh, and then it will stop from the US perspective. Um, my colleagues, Gareth and Felix, um, I'm just gonna note very quickly and they can get into more detail. Um, this third bullet here talks about the UK's announcement of phasing out in the EU's announcement of its plan um, between before 2030. Uh, Gareth, I wonder if it might make sense for you to say a word here or you'd rather do it later, but I'd say jump in right now if you want to talk about energy. Yeah, let me let me come in because um, th this is a good example, I think, John, of where uh, the coordination to some extent has to diverge for uh, national interest reasons. The UK uh, is dependent on uh, access to energy from, from Russia, and it cannot cut off those supplies immediately. Uh, it, it, is a simple, uh, it is as simple as that, and therefore the UK, whilst it would want to stop any funds for, for, for this oil going to Russia from tomorrow, it has to be realistic, and therefore the UK will manage that by the end of this year. And just to, to add from the EU, um, that's even probably um, uh, tougher to cut off everything uh, from, from Russian energy supply. Um, as you may know, Germany was about to start a new um, gas pipeline um, and also is, is dependent on, on Russian um, oil, uh, not just gas. So, so the um, developments here are slower in, in that regard and now immediate import bans um, but select restrictions on energy related um, trade and, and um, technology, as I will point out later. Thank you, John. Sure. So, and the last thing I'll say is that I mentioned that the, um, the US restrictions have been put in place across the board, largely to exclude energy other than what's in this new executive order, because the US has wanted to make sure that it's able to work hand in hand with the EU and the UK. And it recognizes the special reliance that the EU has on Russian energy. So there is a general license that in the US that allows um, certain transactions to continue. And there's also guidance that shows that OFAC is intending to allow transactions related to en energy to continue for many months time. Next slide. So it, it sometimes hits, uh, hurts the most uh, what people eat and drink, what the ordinary folks consume. And so uh, President Biden issued a new executive order uh, just the other day that it, uh, stopped US imports of Russian, uh, certain Russian products like seafood, caviar, diamonds and other products. It stopped exports uh, to Russia of luxury goods, which I think the entire G7 agreed to go along with. So you'll likely hear more um, from Gareth and Felix on what their jurisdictions have done. It's also stopped Russian uh, US exports of US denominated banknotes. So no physical US dollar currency to go to Russia. And again, stopping US person investment in any sector of the Russian economy that's later determined by the secretaries of treasury and state. So there's a number of general licenses that are out there that offer wind downs as well as certain guidance and transactions that will be allowed. Next slide. So the, I wanted to make sure that we're clear, as I said at the beginning, on what we're talking about, our use of terms. 
So blocking sanctions are the toughest sanctions, as you know. They're what the EU and the UK may call asset freezes, where you prohibit any transaction with the blocked party or the sanctioned party, and you require the um, assets to be frozen within the jurisdiction. In the United States, there's also the rule that if you block or freeze assets of a sanctioned party, you have to report them to OFAC within 10 business days. And it also applies to entities owned 50% or more directly or indirectly by one or more sanctioned parties. The EU and the UK have their own twist on what OFAC is called the 50% rule. And in this way, the UK and the EU are tougher than the, the US, so it pays to understand uh, those concerns. And I should know, this will be a couple times that I may reference that these affect both primary and secondary sanctions. And I wanna explain my terminology here. Primary sanctions are those that are affect within US jurisdiction. So it stops Americans like me, no matter where we are. Um, any entities like most of you that may be a Chinese entity, but you're operating in the United States. If you're operating in the United States, then you're prohibited from doing any business in or through the US that are prohibited by US sanctions. Your Chinese parent, your Chinese affiliates can do some of that business, but you in the United States, or any operations that you have here are not allowed to. And it's very important to remember that. But I do wanna note that some of these may also have some secondary sanctions implications that we need to be aware of. And so basically those are the sanctions that can be targeted against non-US persons uh, for activity wholly outside the United States uh, if uh, the US determines that it's important. It's either formal secondary sanctions or what are called material support where the US is allowed to sanction anyone that provides material support to a sanctioned party. And this is where I think when you see the political divide where the rest of the world is watching to see how China uh, responds to these sanctions and will Chinese companies be viewed as backfilling US or EU companies, this is a very important consideration for Chinese companies to consider. Next slide. So the blocking sanctions in the US and I think in many other jurisdictions have targeted Russian political figures, Russian elites like oligarchs and Belarusian uh, powerful individuals and entities. Here are some of the examples of that. There are new people being put on the list every day. Uh, Gareth and Felix were updating their slides right before this presentation because uh, there, our presentation was already getting old uh, just by being prepared last night because of new sanctions. And funnily enough, right before this started, OFAC issued new sanctions against Russian human rights abusers. So these uh, the, the sanctions uh, targeting Russia will continue almost each and every day. Next slide. So here are some of the major Russian financial institutions, among others, that have been targeted by these blocking sanctions or asset freeze sanctions. Some of the largest Russian banks out there are now targeted, and companies only have a limited amount of time, a couple weeks, to wind down most transactions with some of these banks, and perhaps of a couple months to wind down certain debt and equity related transactions with these banks. Next slide. So correspondent account sanctions, as many of you may know, are different than blocking sanctions. They basically say, if you have a correspondent account sanction, it basically prevents US financial institution from serving as a correspondent for um, some sanctioned Russian financial institutions that may be added to a sanctions list. So the US did not want to impose full blocking sanctions on Russia's largest financial institution, Spare Bank, probably because it might impact largely the ordinary Russian citizen. So what OFAC and the US government did is put Spare Bank under correspondent account sanctions, preventing US financial institutions from maintaining correspondent accounts on behalf of Spare Bank and dozens of its subsidiaries. Next slide. And so if I'm talking about the level of sanctions, I'm gonna say 
Up here at the top, you have the blocking and asset freeze sanctions, which prevent virtually all transactions with a sanctioned party or anyone they own or maybe own or control. The next level down would be the correspondent account sanctions, which largely prevent transactions through US jurisdiction with sanctioned parties. And then a step below that, you have the debt and equity restrictions that the US, the EU, and I think the UK as well, after Brexit has imposed that basically limit certain financing that can be given to certain Russian major corporations. And so the US has imposed debt and equity restrictions on the key Russian state-owned and private entities, including the largest financial institutions, Gazprom, the world's largest natural gas company, others in the energy sector, some in the diamond mining sector, Russian railways, kind of across the board on uh, these sectors. And it's basically the first in a step where the US is saying the United States will not allow financing for of these Russian major institutions that continue to benefit the Russian state. Next slide. So one last point I should generally make in terms of sanctions is I think if you think of US sanctions generally, at the very top level, you can think of them in two ways. The first way is the blacklist, the list that we've been talking about, whether it's the asset freeze list, what's called the SDN list, um, or the sectoral sanctions list. On the other hand, there's what we generally consider comprehensive sanctions. There are certain regions of the world that are no-goes from a US perspective. You can't deal with Cuba, you can't deal with Iran or North Korea or Syria. In 2014, the Crimea region of Ukraine, which was annexed forcibly by Russia, was added to that list. And now the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, the separatist regions of Ukraine, have largely been added to that comprehensive list as well. It largely prevents all US transactions with those regions of Ukraine. So it's investment, imports, exports, provision of goods or services, financing. So there is a wind down period that's supposed to last for about another week. And then after that, uh, the transactions with the US nexus to those separatist regions will largely have to stop. They've joined in that sense, the comprehensive programs that OFAC had before. Next slide. So flight restrictions is something I can talk about, that, but they're generally uh, impacting all the jurisdictions that Gareth, Felix, and I are talking about. The US, Canada, EU, and UK, among many others, have taken steps to close their airspace to Russian aircraft. Russian aircraft, Russia has responded by closing its airspace to a number of these jurisdictions, um, which means that it's very difficult to take off and land to allow travel between them. But the idea was to impose significant costs and pressure on the Russian economy. So this may make it difficult for all of you in any kind of travel between uh, Russia and these jurisdictions, or even travel involving China and many of these jurisdictions that might ordinarily have gone over some of this airspace. Next slide. The last thing I'll talk about before turning this over to my colleague Felix to discuss the EU sanctions would be some of the fallout from sanctions. The sanctions impose severe immediate and long-term costs on Russia's economy, most directly by the loss of foreign investment. You've seen US and third country companies fleeing Russia as fast as can be, devaluation of the ruble, the unstable stock market that they haven't even allowed to open for weeks because of these restrictions. The impact on international energy markets and the requirement that global com companies like all of yours uh, reconsider their existing relationship with Russia, Belarus, and these certain areas of Ukraine and all of your sanctions compliance program compliance and controls because you don't wanna make a mistake in this environment. And I said it before, I'll say it again, um, as Chinese companies, you have to watch and see what the government of China's um, public outreach is with respect 
to the war between Russia and Ukraine. But you also have to look at is, uh, entities operating in the private sector. What will be the impact on all of you if any of your um, companies are seen as backfilling or continuing to deal with Russia in a way that allows the Russian war effort? You could rapidly face not only legal, but significant reputational exposure. As you can probably see from the headlines, companies doing business with Russia continue to make the headlines in all of our countries and all of our jurisdictions each and every day because of the brutality of the war that we're all seeing on our television sets. And we should say war coordinated sanctions to come. The EU's just finished around, the UK's just finished around, and the US is just finished around, and there will be more to come. Final point, Russia has and will likely impose further countermeasures, meaning they'll penalize US, EU, UK companies that openly say they're gonna comply with US sanctions and start to pull out and take other actions. So while it's important to abide by the laws of the jurisdictions, it's also important to make sure that you do it appropriately considering the legal, reputational and pragmatic risks on the ground. With that said, thank you for your time. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Felix, um, is, uh, for his comments. And then I can get back to, I see the, that a question came in for me, but we can take it at the end. Felix? Thank you, John. Um, yes, happy to, to provide an overview of the EU sanctions. And um, as you see from, um, from this agenda, uh, it is pretty similar to what John just described. And the reason is um, that uh, indeed uh, the US, EU, and also the UK have taken uh, a very um, yeah, similar approach and uh, multilateral approach aligned their, <clears throat> their actions. So um, you will uh, see a lot of similarities. Um, and I will try to, to point out uh, the differences because um, uh, to be compliant with uh, global sanctions, it is important to identify uh, the differences between the, the um, global regimes um, and to, uh, um, to have the compliance programs in effect that match these uh, specificities. And um, please, uh, let's go to the next slide. And uh, there, um, I will um, start with when do EU sanctions apply and why is that? We just heard from, uh, from John that there is a difference between primary and secondary sanctions and secondary sanctions uh, under the US uh, laws may apply uh, extraterritorially and, and affect uh, companies without any US uh, link. In the EU, it's different. We just have um, the, the primary side of sanctions which however needs to be looked at carefully because it may also have some, uh, some broader reach. So for, um, to start with, the EU regulations apply across the EU. So um, when they are published in the, in the official journal, like we expect today for another round of, of Russia sanctions set by, by the EU, um, these will have immediate and direct effect in, in the EU member states, so in, in, in every country in the EU. Um, it has a, an impact on individuals because every national of an EU member state um, everywhere in the world must follow EU sanctions and everybody within the EU territory has to follow EU sanctions as well. For entities, it is important to note that of course, any subsidiaries of Chinese companies or US-based companies in the EU also um, have to um, follow EU sanctions laws because uh, if they are incorporated um, or constituted under the laws of one member state, it's, uh, it's mandatory to um, comply with EU rules. Um, also, if a non-EU company is active within the EU ter territory for whatever reason, um, uh, the EU sanctions apply as well. And the final point uh, on this slide is important because even being outside the EU, whenever there is a transaction or a specific business that has whatever link to the EU because it's done in whole or in part within the EU, 
um, EU sanctions apply as well. And that's probably the broadest um, hook that EU sanctions um, may have. Um, for example, if there is a um, data infrastructure used in, in the EU uh, server infrastructure and data is, is um, taken for a business um, outside the EU, but, but has this uh, yeah, data link to the EU, this might, might already trigger EU sanctions applicability. Next slide, please. Um, so if we are aware of this um, applicability of the EU sanctions, uh, we can look uh, into the details of the Russia sanctions framework. Um, and again, it's similar like um, what we've just heard from, from John, uh, starting with the timeline in 2014 due to the annexation of uh, Crimea. The EU also uh, imposed sanctions. This was already a very multilateral approach and agreed approach. So um, you, you will see the EU also imposed um, um, yeah, sectoral sanctions uh, that we just learned um, under the term terminology of debt and equity um, uh, sanctions. Um, individuals were added to the sanctions lists, uh, meaning that these sanctioned persons um, were blocked in the US terminology or um, subject to an asset freeze and the prohibition to provide funds or economic resources to such persons under the EU ter terminology um, and also far-reaching trade restrictions were imposed. The same um, uh, is now true concerning um, the trade restrictions, uh, the new um, uh, regions of Donetsk and Luhansk that are, um, that are uh, yeah, uh, the, the target of the, in the initial invasion um, and uh, in between we have seen listings under other EU sanctions measures like the horizontal regimes um, that do not apply country specific. It's what just John said that the additional um, US listings have been made under human rights violation sanctions. The same exists in the EU. So um, in the last few years, we have seen listings under uh, this regime and also the uh, counter cyber attacks sanctions regime and the prol proliferation of chemical weapons regimes where Russian individuals have been um, designated. And now since uh, 23rd of February 2022, we have seen this um, increase uh, of, of uh, sanctions measures um, by the EU. Um, and let's go to the next slide to, to go into more detail what we have um, now in effect in the EU. Starting again with this, uh, um, with this huge instrument of of sanctions against uh, the central bank that is also matched by the EU um, to have this broad impact uh, that John already described. Um, under EU law, this means that transactions related to the management of reserves as well as of assets of the central bank are prohibited. Um, and this also applies to, to um, related entities uh, such as the Russian National Wealth Fund. Um, there are also um, yeah, debt and equity-like um, uh, prohibitions regarding the central bank, transferable securities and money market instrument issued by the uh, central bank um, cannot be dealt with uh, freely and, and also loans and credits cannot be made to, to uh, Russia, its government and the central bank. Um, another um, prohibition was introduced um, to prohibit, prohibit any um, investing participation in projects co-financed by the Russian Direct Investment Fund. And as discussed earlier, um, the EU imposed the ban um, uh, of SWIFT for, for certain Russian banks and Belarusian banks and their subsidiaries eff effective March 12th already for Russian banks and uh, coming up on March 12th, uh, 20th for the Belarusian banks. Next slide, please. The next layer of, of sanctions uh, in the EU is also the designation or listing of um, individuals or entities that are then subject to, to an asset freeze or to the prohibition to make um, any funds or economic resources available, which comes uh, similar like a, a blocking sanction we, we know from the US terminology. Um, there are some differences and um, the, the most important difference is that um, there is a strict list 
listing principle under the EU rules, meaning only the individual or entity directly listed is subject um, to, to sanctions, to full sanctions. However, um, entities owned or controlled by such individuals or entities may also be uh, subject to restrictions. Um, uh, and that is the case if uh, there's an ownership of 50%, um, uh, more than 50%, there's a presumption that this um, entity uh, is owned and, and would also fall under the restrictions. And uh, more broader is the concept of control. That means that even below a shareholding threshold of 50%, um, an, a listed shareholder may still control the, the entity and uh, restrictions would apply as well to, to such an entity. Um, we have heard that there are listings coming up uh, practically every day. Um, we are expecting a new list coming out later today. And uh, the reason um, is that there is a broad um, scheme, legal uh, uh, scheme for the EU to impose su such uh, sanctions on, on individuals and entities um, for the reasons given here, like undermining or threatening the territorial uh, integrity of Ukraine and supporting the Russia government and so on. Um, so these are then the, the uh, legal basis for any, any listings. Next slide, please. Um, here, this slide just shows some, some examples of um, entities and individuals uh, already listed in the past few uh, weeks and days. Um, to point out, uh, there are three Russian financial institutions um, fully blocked by the EU, um, uh, and, and there are certain oligarchs. That is something we, we see a lot now um, that, that have been listed, and uh, the concept I just explained, the concept of ownership and control needs to be applied to identify the entities owned or controlled by such uh, oligarchs. Um, uh, so this is uh, an important factor right now, um, and we will see more oligarchs being listed uh, shortly. So, so this analysis is something companies should do with their counterparties to identify whether there's any um, entity or, or individual um, as a shareholder um, up to the UBO, so the ultimate beneficial owner. And as pointed out here, we expect uh, further, further designations um, uh, today. Next slide, please. We have um, uh, capital market restrictions uh, that are also similar, like the debt and equity uh, restrictions uh, we have learned about from John regarding the US. Um, uh, these are in place since 2014 already. and. Um, additional banks were listed um, in the past few weeks and additional industrial companies, as you see from this uh, slide. Um, there's one important difference compared to uh, the existing restrictions. We know it's since 2014. That is um, that the maturity um, of, of uh, the securities issued of, of the loans or credits granted um, will not be decisive anymore going forward for any new um, uh, issues, uh, um, securities issued or, or loans granted. Um, so this uh, may have a, a huge, huge impact on, on businesses as well. Next slide, please. Um, here we summarize the, the additional capital market restrictions that the EU has imposed. Um, that is um, uh, yeah, also in line with the multilateral approach, for example, um, Physical banknotes cannot be um, um, exported or, or even transferred within the EU for use in Russia or Belarus anymore. Um, and there are additional financial uh, restrictions, um, including what we now expect for later today to come, that um, the EU bans the rating of Russia and Russian companies by EU credit rating agencies which will have an, an additional impact um, uh, for, for Russian entities to get access to the EU's financial markets. Next slide, please. Um, one, one additional aspect to mention uh, are the trade restrictions and export control restrictions that the EU has imposed. Um, there are similar um, export control restrictions. We have not 
uh, touched on in detail um, on the US side. But for the EU, this is not a separate regime. It's really within the sanctions framework. So the EU sanctions regulations have specific provisions that uh, yeah, supersede the existing export control framework um, and now prohibit uh, the gen generally um, any sales, supply, transfer, or export of dual use items to Russia or for use in Russia. And uh, in addition to the general dual use list that is um, uh, relevant here, there are specific lists under sanctions um, regulations that cover high tech goods and other technology. So the, the scope of restrictions is broader. And in addition, um, companies may not get a license anymore that was able that, that was possible to get under the general export control framework. And here we come also to the energy uh, sector. Um, as pointed out earlier, there is no uh, broad um, ban on import of, of energy um, so far imposed by the EU, but there are certain restrictions um, concerning the energy and transport sectors. Um, that's the type of targeted measures the, the EU um, tends to use uh, if it wants to really um, uh, prohibit certain activity but not harm um, uh, any, any sector too broadly or have um, uh, yeah, effects back uh, in the EU that, that are um, not desired. Um, we, of course, also have a concept of, of exceptions and authorizations. Um, uh, however, this is, uh, this is different from the US because we do not have uh, the set of general licenses that is uh, in effect already in the US. So uh, if there are licenses, um, uh, license application um, possibilities, this is really means um, an individual an individual license is needed and the company must um, apply for it with the competent, competent national authority. Next slide, please. Um, the additional sanctions we expect today uh, will, will uh, concern um, for example, listing of additional um, companies, state-owned enterprises, um, but also the import ban on certain iron and steel products um, and um, investment bans on the Russian energy sector. Again, a, a targeted um, tool for the energy sector without um, prohibiting the import into the EU of, um, of energy products. And um, one thing John already mentioned in, in effect in the US, we will now also impose restrictions on luxury goods, cars, jewelry, and so on. Um, this is expected to be published today in the official journal and may um, come into effect either today or tomorrow. Um, next slide, please. The additional restrictions uh, concerning the regions of Donetsk and Luhansk are similar to the Crimea region. Um, this also involves broad trade bans and investment bans. Um, we also have a uh, um, broad prohibition for Russian aircrafts to enter the EU airspace. Um, and uh, for all those that are listed individual, individually under the EU sanctions, um, there are also restrictions on their visas, so um, uh, they cannot enter the EU uh, and additional visa restrictions have been imposed uh, for diplomats and, and other Russians. Um, and finally, one important um, uh, aspect, the EU has also banned Russia Today and Sputnik from broad broadcasting in the EU, um, so this is a rather new tool to um, to uh, prevent disinformation and, and stop the broadcasting of these um, these media channels related to the Russian government. Next slide, please. So um, just to quickly uh, conclude, uh, we have seen a lot of similarities um, with the US approach. Um, that shows the multilateral approach taken by, by the um, major jurisdictions imposing sanctions globally. Um, the differences are important uh, concerning the different listings of, of individuals and entities a screen against the EU consolidated list in addition to any OFAC or UK lists. 
um, uh, and the EU nexus, of course, uh, for, for any companies operating in China or in the US to see whether the EU um, uh, regulations apply at all to, to the business. Uh, we expect more, um, uh, more sanctions to come and also some guidance from, from the Commission and national authorities. So this is still fluid and um, uh, yeah, we will um, uh, see how this develops and over to, to Gareth now to see uh, how the current status in the UK is. Thank you. Thank you, Felix, and thank you, John. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, now that you've heard from John and Felix, I think one thing is probably very clear. The message uh, that, that comes is that coordination is paramount to achieve maximum impact. And that's why each of the jurisdictions we represent have, apart from some of the differences you've heard about, been united in acting together uh, to, to try and, as I say, have maximum impact. Let, let, let me pick out one or two differences. And the first thing that I need to point out is that it's important that until the end of uh, 2020, everything you've just heard from Felix would apply to the UK because we were a member state. And it was only at the end of that year that uh, Brexit came into effect and we left and we introduced our own sanctions regulations. But they were almost entirely the same as those we'd operated under before as a member state. One or two important changes, and I'm going to touch on them now, and John has already mentioned one, which may be quite significant. And it's under ownership and control. You will all know, I'm sure, that if you want to see if someone is sanctioned in the US, the EU, or the UK, there are lists which you need to go to to check whether or not you're about to do business with someone whose assets have been frozen, uh, as, as we understand is the process. It, it's, it's not straightforward in the UK because if you have a look and you see that an entity is not on the list, that's not the end of the matter. You, you have to go beyond that and, 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 and look more carefully because you can see in the middle of the slide that whilst we have the same essential rules as in the US about share ownership and 50%, same applies in the EU, and the EU goes beyond that. The UK goes a step further and says that you really have to look a little bit more closely to check, and you can see that the typing in the middle of the slide, that the designated person, in the language of the UK, that means the sanctioned person is able to achieve the result that the affairs of the entity you're looking at, having regard to all the circumstances, are conducted in accordance with that person's wishes. wishes. Now that might, that might be about political influence of some sort, or it may be that it's because the ultimate beneficial owner of this entity uh, has organized things so that their ultimate ownership is hidden from view. But it does mean that you have to take care, particularly when you're dealing with the UK lists. And at the bottom of the slide, I deal with something you've heard about from John and Felix, UK nexus, exactly the same as US EU involvement of any natural or legal person uh, in the UK, or any UK person anywhere in the world, and that includes uh, a UK legal entity. Let's go to the next slide. And now I'm, I'm going to move much more quickly through these slides because you'll have them at the end. Uh, and repeating all of the things that you've heard so far from John and Felix may not be helpful. But here you can see that on the 10th of February, when it was inevitable that this invasion was going to take place, the, the, the British government put in place a wider scope so that it was ready to be able to sanction uh, more people than previously had, it had been able to do. Uh, and, and the test that it applied in doing that was looking to those involved in obtaining a benefit from or supporting the government of Russia. And in practice, that has meant the government and the regime of Putin. So that's what's important, that was our starting point. 
and it enabled the British government to move quickly in response to the invasion and to impose in, uh, uh, sanctions in respect of fi financial matters, trade, immigration, and transport. Next slide, please. Now here in one slide, if, uh, if we were to spend time here, we will see a duplication of the core sanctions which have uh, been, been dealt with already by John and Felix. This is all about asset freezes. This is about controlling and managing and restricting Russian business and Russian banks. And at the bottom, it's not spelt out, but this is the Russian Central Bank. As John said, and Felix said again, this is the most important sanction, the one that was unexpected and the one that may already have had the greatest impact in restricting the Russian government's ability to support the ruble. But th th there's a list and the important point without spending too much time is that this is a duplication of what you've heard already, coordination for maximum impact. Let's go to the next slide, please. And, and here, here are some more. Again, most of them are, are what you've heard about already. The second bullet and the, uh, and the fourth bullet are different. The ban of Russian ships and vessels from UK ports, particular to the UK, and for obvious reasons. As an island trading nation, that was a particular sanction that was put in place because it would have impact uh, in, in, in the UK, and it already has, with large ships laden with Russian produce being turned away uh, from the ports. Uh, and the London Stock Exchange, an important tra uh, trading exchange in Europe, suspending trading in 35 companies with strong links. These sorts of things, when they came in in the last three weeks, were not expected. They were news. They were uh, talked about with a certain amount of surprise, but as things are, uh, are developing and the changes and the new sanctions are being brought in, everyone is beginning to realize that the UK government alongside its uh, uh, allies in the US and the EU and other jurisdictions means business and is implementing sanctions far beyond what some people expected even three weeks ago. Let's go to the next slide, please. This one and the next one is, uh, is no more than lists, which uh, either now or later you will look, uh, and it illustrates and provides the evidence that there is a, a, a complete overlap between the entities and the individuals who are being sanctioned and, uh, and included are the Belarusian entities, just to emphasize that that regime so closely aligned to Putin is also uh, being restricted in the same way. Let, let's go to the next slide because there you see individuals and the, the same point arises, although I'll point out Roman Abramovich, you see bottom left, is of course very well known in, in, in the UK because he owns Chelsea Football Club. Chelsea Football Club, if food, as John said, is important to the people uh, 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 of Europe and every jurisdiction, well, football is extremely important. Winners of the European Champions League last year, and now it is being restricted in anything that it can do because its owner is a Russian oligarch. Next slide, please. A couple of slides here that simply set out the general licenses which have been issued. These licenses, are intended, again, as John has already mentioned, to protect, at least in the short term, legitimate business, of course, legitimate UK business, and it is to reduce the impact of collateral damage, uh, because of course that is bound to happen if you put in place such wide ranging uh, sanctions against the banks and the businesses that we've been dealing with. What one, uh, let's go to the next slide because coming back to Mr. Abramovich, uh, 
There's a general license at the bottom, which relates to Chelsea Football Club. And it, it simply says that the club can pay for transport to its next game and it can pay the players wages. But it's very restrictive uh, and life at Chelsea Football Club was transformed overnight. Let, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is the last slide and this is, uh, so far as the UK is concerned, what happened overnight. Uh, some of this we managed to get onto the slide, some things happened too late. But the piece of legislation which introduced the measures uh, ready for post-Brexit was the Sanctions and Anti-Money Laundering Act 2018. The government felt that it restricted it and if it imposed sanctions on certain individuals, there was a risk that those wealthy oligarchs may threaten the UK with a claim for damages. So they've changed the legislation. The Economic Crime Act was passed by Parliament overnight, and it not only deals with that potential difficulty, but it also introduces new measures so that if, for example, the EU or the US were to designate an individual, introduce blocking statute, uh, uh, overnight the next day, the UK, if it chose, could simply mirror that action under new legislation so it didn't have to wait and consider all, of course, to make sure that coordination had maximum impact. The, the other important thing it did, and going back to uh, uh, ownership that I was talking about at the beginning, there's been a debate in the UK for a very long time that too many people, including Russian people, were able to hide themselves from view so that their property and their, their ownership of property could not be identified. The rules have been changed very, very quickly to ensure that the ownership of property in the UK now must be transparent. And the intention is that everyone will be able to check very easily who actually owns property. Uh, and that's important, not only for sanctions, but also for anti-money laundering and in other ways. Uh, so that's, that's a quick gallop through what's happening in the UK. The message is so important. Of course, what you've heard from me is confirmation of what you heard from John and Felix. Acting together, coordinating maximum impact is what's happening. And each government is taking a slightly different approach here and there. But really, it's a comprehensive and united approach um, that, that we've been describing to you today. And I'll jump back in and say, thank you, Gareth. Thank you, Felix, uh, for your parts of the presentation. We have a whole three minutes left and I'm gonna gallop through the questions that we've received. And if there are a couple others, uh, please let me know. And Gareth and Felix, take a look because a couple say EU or UK. So if I get through these in two minutes, I may turn to you for the last one. Uh, the first question is, if spare bank transactions for US persons, why are there also debt and equity? How does that work? So the two spare bank uh, restrictions from the US or the two broad ones would be on correspondent account sanctions, meaning US banks can't have a correspondent account for spare bank, but they also have a separate restriction saying that other US persons, besides US banks holding an account, other US persons can't provide longer term financing for spare banks. So those are two different uh, types of transaction. The second question is, is it okay to process payment from an individual in China to an um, individual in Russia for living fee? Yes, as long as nobody's on the sanctions list. So that's all fine, as long as you're not hitting anybody on the sanctions list. Is it okay to process a payment from an individual in China to a university in Russia for tuition? How about bank-to-bank -bank payment for foreign exchange and involving a bank located in Russia? Yes, you can process a payment from an individual in China to a university in Russia for tuition, so long as nobody's on a sanctions list. Now, how about bank-to-bank -bank payment for foreign exchange involving a bank located in Russia? This is more complicated. If anybody's on a sanctions list, then you're in trouble, even the banks. And also for foreign exchange, the US, the UK, and the EU have made clear 
that supplementing Russia's foreign exchange abilities is part of the restrictions that they're putting into place. So any kind of foreign exchange that goes to Russia these days would be something that the authorities uh, would look very, very uh, askance at. Uh, the next question is, is sanctions significantly increased chance of Russia international debt default? What do you think of this? Will this impact the worldwide economy? Absolutely. This is going to all impact the worldwide economy. But first and foremost, the war that Russia has imposed against Ukraine is imposing, uh, impacting the worldwide economy. Refugees by the hundreds of thousands are fleeing Ukraine, which is impacting the worldwide economy. So will all of this on all of this all of the markets and including Russia's international default uh, potential of that. I think the, the hope from the US, the EU and the UK is that Russia will pull back in its violence in, in Ukraine before it completely demolishes its own economy. Uh, the last question is, these sanctions appear substantial and will lead to substantial costs for Russia along with the EU and the US. How long can these sanctions endure? Do the sanctions become less effective over time as parties adapt? Yes, sanctions become less effective over time as parties adapt. But by and large, I think the hope from the US, the EU, the UK, from Japan, from South Korea, from Switzerland, from New Zealand, from Australia, from Canada, from so many jurisdictions around the world, it's to impose these sanctions to tell Russia to stop the violence in Ukraine before the cost for the worldwide economy become too much to bear. With that said, on behalf of Gareth and Felix, I'm gonna say thank you. Um, thank you to the Chinese General Chamber of Commerce for inviting us to speak with all of you today. And thank you to all of you for appearing. I think we're one minute over. So with that, I'll turn back to Sherry with the apologies for going a minute over. Thank you. Oh, no, John. Thank you so much again, John, Felix, and Gareth for sharing your insights with the group. Today's session was very informative and we hope it was help to many of you to in today as well. Before we end our program today, I just want to make a really quick announcement. In the coming weeks, CGCC will be sending out our annual business survey on Chinese enterprises in the US. So if you are a Chinese enterprise in the US, we sincerely hope you will take part in it. Thank you all again, and thanks for everyone joining us today. Have a great day and see you again soon.